transportation, infrastructure, land, border protection, veterans affairs, and procurement calls this public hearing to order. It is now 2 p.m. on Tuesday, May 5th, 2015. Um, hopefully, senators will be coming uh, to join us, either that or uh, they, they, are, they are watching uh, the proceedings from their office. Um, the purpose of this public hearing is to receive testimony on Bill 85-33, which was uh, introduced by myself, and it's an act to authorize the Guam Regional Transit Authority to enter into a long-term public-private partnership that will enable an investor-financed implementation of the Government of Guam Transit Business Plan uh, that was adopted in the year um, uh, 2010. And joining me today is Senator Tony Hedda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for joining me. Um, notice of this public hearing was provided to senators, stakeholders, and the local media on April 27th, uh, meeting the five-day notice, and on May 1st, 2015, meeting the 48-hour notice uh, as required by the open government law. This public hearing is also being broadcast on local television so for those who will be testifying, uh, please make sure you speak clearly into the microphone. The committee will continue to receive written testimony until 5 p.m. on, um, well, Monday, May 12th, but I think we're going to go ahead and extend that to the end of that week because the uh, uh, legislative session has been pushed back uh, one week uh, as opposed to the week of May 18th. Uh, please address the testimony to Senator Thomas C. Adda, Chairperson, Committee on Transportation. Now, um, before we begin, I just want to give a real brief synopsis of what Bill 85-33 is about. Um, first of all, it authorizes GRTA to enter into a long-term public-private uh, partnership for an investor finance implementation of at a minimum, the Guam Transit Business Plan. Secondly, under the public-private partnership, a private partner would be expected to finance and manage the capital and delivery of transit services. The Guam Regional Transit Authority will then assume a role of contract administration and oversight of the services. Thirdly, the public-private partnership would be a relationship of up to 20 years with a base contract period of five years um, re with three options to renew uh, of five years, three, three options to renew of up um, five years for a total of up to 20 years. Uh, GovGuam will also be expected to provide investment incentives such as tax rebates, public subsidy, use of government real estate, and uh, any other sort of incentive uh, that an investor might need to be willing to enter into such a partnership. Uh, the bill lays out two methods of source selection. Uh, one method, which is right now not um, allowed uh, for in the Guam procurement law, but that is the what is called the uh, request for a competitive proposal where price price is not um, the, the sole determining factor. Instead, price would only have a weight of about 50% at the very most, and we will then have other factors that would be, um, that would be uh, um, used to determine who uh, provides the best proposal. Uh, an alternative source selection method is, is uh, provided in the bill, which is the request for proposal. And the request for proposal, uh, basically offerers would submit their proposals and the top, uh, basically, you know, you rate the proposals and um, the, the proposal that gets the highest rating uh, will then sit down um, for, for basically negotiation of the price. And if, um, if uh, an agreement cannot be reached on the price, then um, 
then you say goodbye to that offerer and you sit down with the next offerer who has provided the next best proposal. Um, the bill requires that a task force be appointed by the governor uh, and this task force will basically have the responsibility for uh, putting together the solicitation package, uh, getting it issued, uh, evaluating the packages, the proposals that are received, and then of, uh, ultimately selecting uh, who the private partner uh, would be. Uh, already efforts have been initiated uh, by communicating with some of the federal agencies to see if uh, federal funds might be available to, uh, to, to be able to um, uh, procure consulting services to assist the task force <clears throat> in putting together the solicitation package and you know getting this thing to its finality. Um, if all goes well, <clears throat> the target date for a contract award, <clears throat> we would be looking at around February of 2016. That's about, uh, that's giving it about nine months um, considering that the bill requires that the governor appoints within 30 days. Um, and then the task uh, appoints a task force within 30 days. Then uh, that task force will have so many days, I believe it was 60 days, to put together a solicitation package. Um, then, of course, it's going to most likely have to go to the Attorney General's office to get reviewed. And there's all these steps. And as a result, I, 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 um, I estimate that it's probably going to take a total of about nine months to get us to the contract signing stage. Uh, I also want to um, uh, acknowledge the presence of Senator Mike Nicholas. Thank you, Senator, for joining us. And so with that, we're going to go ahead then and start receiving testimony. Uh, I have received testimony already from Ms. Roseanne Ada, um, with, and her input basically has to do with, um, with uh, membership uh, composition of the task force. I have received uh, testimony from Mr. John Brown, uh, who has provided input regarding the uh, solicitation uh, methodology. Um, and I believe that's all the uh, written testimonies that uh, we have gotten so far. So I'm going to go ahead and call up, um, I'm going to call up the first four people who have signed up. Uh, to provide uh, their testimonies. I want to acknowledge the presence of Senator uh, Tina Barnes. Thank you, Senator, for joining us. Um, so I'm going to call up, uh, in the order that they sign, uh, Mr. Ken Leon Guerrero, Mr. Frank Ongakta, Mr. Enrique Augustine, and I have here a John Stein, but I, I noticed you didn't you didn't check off that you wanted to give oral testimony. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's right. Okay. Uh, and uh, the fourth one would be uh, Ms. Cecilia Paris. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start with uh, Ken. Uh, please go ahead and for the record state your name and uh, proceed with your testimony. My name is Ken Leon Guerrero. I'm a resident of Santa Rita and a big uh, supporter of uh, mass transit. I support this bill and I would like to make the following comments. Uh, the first thing that I would like to note is that um, back in 1974, 
76, I think it was, 77, I was a Truman Scholar, Guam's first Truman Scholar, and I got my scholarship based on writing a public position paper creating a mass transit system for Guam. And I'm pleased to see that a lot of the elements that I highlighted back then are incorporated into this bill. And so on that basis, I would like to draw your attention to this handout that I gave you guys. This is a copy of a report from the Federal Highway Administration talking about transportation and housing costs. And I direct your attention to the pie chart on the right. Auto-dependent exurbs. That's basically the same description as the communities of Guam. These are uh, groups of people that live in residential areas that are not served by mass transit and they are totally dependent on autos. If you look at there, the discretionary income 25% of the discretionary expenses are consumed by transportation costs. Now bear in mind this report is based on um, the cost of gas and operations in the mainland and this morning according to the Bloomberg report a gallon of gas in Los Angeles is $2.33. So I would submit that the cost of operating a vehicle here on Guam is much higher. Having a mass transit system available to the people of Guam would result in a reduction in their cost of living, money they could divert away from gasoline and pay for things like education, clothing, food for their families. Backing up this chart right here, there's another report that will be submitted to the committee. I didn't want to print it because it's 136 pages, but I'm going to quote from it. It was a study done of mass transit in Vancouver, uh, Canada. I mean, Victoria, Canada. And the researchers analyzing mass transit systems there determined that the traditional studies of mass transit benefits failed to qualify mobility benefits, the cost of vehicle ownership, and parking costs. If efficient land use, and these are, oddly enough, the largest benefits a community will receive from mass transit. When you look at New York City, 15 years ago they were on the brink of bankruptcy, but under Mayor Bloomberg they embarked on a very ambitious program to revitalize New York City. What they did is rezoned all the blocks and the buildings and lots surrounding the mass transit corridors and extended the mass transit corridors. In uh, 15 years, they rezoned 40% of the uh, land in New York City and most of it around the transit corridors that resulted in dramatic increases in revenue for the city, higher population densities which stimulated business growth and pulled New York City out of bankruptcy to where the city began running a series of uh, uh, surpluses. So we're looking at mass transit to do the same thing here on Guam. You know, open up the island open up opportunity for people because we have distinct communities on this island that are not being served. Families right now, because of no mass transit, the average family on Guam may have four or five cars. In my own family, we had eight kids, we had five cars, and we still had a lot of fights. Among my brothers and sisters now, when I look at them and their children, and their, in cases their grandchildren, it seems like they have a car for the mother, a car for the father, and one car for every two kids. That is not sustainable for the family going forward. That's why the discretionary income on Guam is so low, and we have such a large number of families on Guam who qualify for food stamps, even though they're still working. So bringing a mass transit system will help Guam's families. The second way mass transit system will help, we have a large immigrant population. When they come to Guam, they are on welfare for a long time because they don't have the ability to get a job. And once they do get a job, they don't have the ability to maintain a job. When I relocated to Hawaii from Guam, I didn't have a car. I got a job, but I relied very heavily on mass transit to get me to and from work until I was able to save enough money that I was able to buy a car. And even though I had a car, Living in Honolulu, I spent 75% of my commute time on the bus. And as a result, I only did between three and 4,000 miles a year on my car. Here on Guam, I do 1,000 miles a month. 
So when you look at how much resources that consumes from my family, that is money that's not going into local businesses. I forget what the exact number is, but I think either 94 or 96 percent of the money spent on gasoline leaves the island, whereas the money that's spent in local businesses cycles through the economy several times. The next area that would benefit from a strong an efficient public transport system would be people with disabilities. For a number of years, I was CEO of Able Industries. We were the island's largest employer of people with disabilities. At the time I started, we had 86 employees. Uh, at the time we closed operations, we had over 206. But the number one reason for termination in Able Industries was no call, no show. In other words, the people weren't able to get on the bus, they didn't have any cell phones, so they weren't able to call and let their uh, staff or their supervisors know that they weren't able to get on the bus. The irregularity of the bus schedule, we had people who were starting work at 1 o'clock at Anderson Air Force Base catching the bus at 5 o'clock in the morning just so they could get to work. That is unsustainable. When you look at the impact and the growing numbers of people with disabilities on Guam, it is very important that we have a mass transit system that will provide for their ability to live a normal life. M many people will tell you that uh, that are dependent on mass transit, that their lives, that literally their lives are tied to the mass transit system. And I know for a fact because some of my employees were not able to get to their dialysis treatments in a timely fashion and had major medical repercussions as a result of not being able to get to a dialysis treatment. The next group that we're looking at is um, veterans. Veterans also are having trouble getting transportation. And uh, I'm, I was uh, given the opportunity by Lad Bell. He was going to try to be here, but he sent his uh, testimony. He wanted me to read it later. It's a short email. I will give it to you at the conclusion. So when we look at the bill that we're talking about here, I believe that the previous legislation created a framework for a strong mass transit system. Unfortunately, the government of Guam didn't hasn't and probably won't have the resources in the foreseeable future to bring the existing legislation as written to fruition. Therefore, I strongly support the idea of a public-private partnership. And we have to go no further than Hawaii than to look at an example of a public-private partnership that works because the bus system in Hawaii is a public-private partnership operation and has been since the late 70s. And it is constantly rated in the top 10 bus systems in the United States. It is the only bus system in the United States that has been rated number one twice. So seeing how we have a smaller footprint on Guam than the bus system has for Honolulu, it is my belief, my very strong belief, that we could have a mass transit system here with the right partner that would be one of the strongest, most efficient, most cost-effective systems in the United States. Um, that concludes my statement. And after, I, if you have any questions, after the questions, I'd like to read a brief statement from the Center for Micronesian Empowerment, if that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have any questions. This, Senator? Okay. Go ahead, okay. Jason, proceed with. The uh, this is an email I received from Lad Bell. He's a case manager for the Center for Micronesian Empowerment. Hi, Ken. CME has been finding jobs for Micronesians for years and recently has been working with West Care Pacific Islands to find jobs for vets. The unreliability of the public transit system on Guam has been and continues to be a major obstacle for, the placement, for placement into employment. Without reliable public transit, it's a chicken and egg situation. If you don't have a car to get the, to work, you can't earn the money you need to buy a car to get to work. If I'm unable to attend the public hearing tomorrow, you are welcome to read my email into the record in support of your efforts to provide reliable and affordable transportation to the people of Guam. Lad Bell, Case Manager, Center for Micronesian Employment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next on the sign-up, I have Mr. Frank Ongata. Good afternoon, Senators. Good, good afternoon. My name is Frank Kool-Aid Ongata. 
and I'm a resident of Mingila and the Marisa Guam. I come before you guys in testimony for both support and non support of this bill. I support everything the concept of the bill of going private partnership and all of that. The only thing I do not support is the timeline. If we think that we're going to finish and get everything done by February 2016 and eight months later uh, sign a contract, currently with what we try to do with GRTA now, just to get contracts signed to procure buses, it goes back and forth from GSA to AG, GSA to AG. They keep kicking the cannon. I volunteer. Let me keep that cannon because if I kick it, I guarantee I won't find it. But we're still waiting, and we're still wondering what's going to happen in that. I agree that we need a public-private partnership to make sure that everybody on the island has reliable transportation. Because I proved recently in the, the last public hearing they had for um, um, the GRTA that I temporarily relocated from Mariso on January of this year just to prove how much I got denied a right to Mingila, uh, from the south into town and how in Mingila I never once got denied a right. We need a system that is reliable for everybody. North, south, east, west because as it stands now my brothers and sisters from the south it hurts we have to get on the bus 5.30 in the morning just to get anywhere in town. I tried to make a schedule to go tomorrow from Mangilao to Mariso. I requested to go 5.30 in the morning, but I was told I would not make it to Mariso until 11.30. I said, can I try to redo this schedule because I got to get to Mariso Post Office, which opens at 10.15. Closes at 12. I want to open it to 3 o'clock. Um, we could try. So I asked, if I took the fixed route from Manila down, will I get there at least by 10.30? Not a guarantee. So this public-private partnership is a good idea. Everything about it is great. Because we know GRT doesn't have the buses. We don't have the manpower. We don't have the staff. We don't even have the drivers. So, as I see it, the current contractor is doing a pretty good job. Now what we want them to do, but with the, the five fix and the six power we got, we're barely scraping the surface. And as I see it, February 16 or 2016 if it does not happen and eight months after that we're still going to be doing what we're doing now because who will want to take a contract to expand more buses and everything expand services expand from island to island and add on additional routes it's hard so I agree with the intent of Everything else but the timeline is where I disagree. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Angakta. Um, Mr. Augustine, you, you signed up next, but I'm going to go ahead and let Ms. Paris um, testify first before you. Um. Oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is that a good distance from the mic? All yes, right. you're fine. Um, you know, I, I, uh, since I have um, the audience now, um, well, first of all, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm just going to express my concern because um, I, I want to be part of this government process, and um, a lot of attention right now is going to... Um, the needs of people with disabilities. And I guess I want to reframe how we present um, this 
and concerns about this. Rather than always having to isolate and focus on needs of people with disabilities, I prefer to um, present right how we think of ourselves as equals and that any discussion would be for ideas of full inclusion. So full inclusion uh, would include people with disabilities, but it would also include people with health equity issues, uh, people um, with needs uh, because they are um, advancing in age. Um, so not to always kind of uh, frame your thinking of people with disabilities as uh, something that's gonna cost a lot of money. Um, and so if we start to think of things as uh, being fully inclusive, then I think we're approaching this from uh, uh, from a um, you know a better viewpoint. And so, and it, for an example, um, in preparing for today's testimony, uh, the initial um, I visited the website, so the Guam Legislature website. Uh, unfortunately, it does not meet ADA compliance standards. I wasn't able to get the information I needed. Um, and um, I was able to, though, from Senator Atta's office, able to get a, an accessible copy of the, the proposed legislation uh, today. Uh, and I, I would have appreciated a little bit more time to review, not only um, Bill 8533, um, but also um, within the history of bills related to and laws related to transportation that I had, number one, accessibility to, to these documents. And then the other thing is enough time to review them. So that, that so I'll just preface um, what I'm going to say today with that. Um, but I do appreciate the, the opportunity to come uh, before you and just uh, kind of give my ideas a little bit. I I'm not here representing any organization. I'm here as a citizen of Guam, uh, wanting to see improvements in our economy. Um, you know, in our facilities. And the only way this is gonna happen is if we, um, if we do it in a co coordinated effort. Um, so in this proposed legislation, um, I, um, I'm not so much against this private um, public partnership. I, I see many benefits that can come of it. Um, but this is all gonna be dependent upon um, the ability of this task force who's been given quite a big job to have, um, I guess, a certain level of technical expertise to be able to negotiate this whole process. Um, I've been riding transit for more than 20 years here on Guam. I've, I've seen it uh, where it was just uh, one or two vans. And so overall, uh, the progress of transportation, public transportation on Guam, from my viewpoint, has improved greatly. Uh, before I would go for months without being able to get a ride anywhere. So I depended heavily on my family. Um, but in wanting to live a more independent life, uh, you know, I, I'm able to do this uh, with the existing um, system. So uh, there have been many improvements since the hiring of a permanent uh, executive manager. Um, Mr. Augustine, uh, not just because of his proximity <laughs> to me right now, but uh, he's been able to identify the problems and systematically go about addressing them. So I feel that there have been improvements. It may, may not be overnight, but he has put steps in place to, to address uh, some of the issues that we have. Just the fact that I can call the office and someone answers, that's a great improvement. Just the fact that um, I see kind of like streamlining of services, improvement in customer service on the part of the contract uh, service provider. So in general, I feel that the system is improving and um, that at the beginning of the legislation, so 8533 towards the beginning, um, it referred to some statistics um, that would reflect the need uh, to enter into this um, private public partnership. Um, I guess I'll, part, uh, I'll present that uh, in my written testimony because it just covers a lot of statistics um, that I don't have access to right now. But overall, to use the pilot project as a reference point, um, it, it, it's, it's not concrete enough. 
because there are many factors that involve this 30% decrease. And over the past few years in ridership that's been documented, uh, I'm not so confident that the um, collection of data on the part of the service provider or on the part of the pre-existing uh, staff from GRTA prior to Mr. Augustine's um, presence there are, are, is reliable data. So uh, at that. Now, as for the composition of the task force, um, there are several parts. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't have the bill in front of me, and I just have my notes. Uh, but overall, uh, I, I, I don't see an engineer in the task force. Um, I see someone from the Guam Visitors Bureau. Um, so I, I think maybe we don't need someone from the Guam Visitors Bureau on this task force. The needs of the tourism industry should be well represented by the, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and um, I'm sorry, my, my thoughts are a bit um, scattered right now. But in, in regards to the task force, I would like to see it more reflect a coordination of government entities who have the technical expertise and also who rely on, on grants um, that can help to fund transportation services. Um, so in particular, we would be looking at um, health equity programs under the Department of Public Health and Social Services. Uh, we would be looking at the um, Department of Education um, providing transportation to the students. So that's something that we haven't addressed is the inclusion of the, the um, public school students as part of the projected ridership for the transportation system. Um, and then also with the Department of Labor, because as Mr. Leon Guerrero said, uh, transit uh, services are essential to um, increasing uh, opportunities for employment, not just for people uh, with disabilities, but people who do not have access, reliable access to transportation. Um, and if we begin to look at this as a dollars and cents approach, you would see that someone who currently is not employed, if they were to be employed uh, and they were to earn, I don't know, we'll take me for instance, because um, I know my figures. <laughs> um, right now I'm, I'm on retirement and I am looking um, to become employed again. Now, one of my primary barriers will be getting to and from my job, or getting to and from where I need to go to perform the duties of my job. Um, currently, I receive a Government of Guam uh, Disability Retirement Pension, um, and it's roughly $25,000. I project that after my training with the Vocational Rehabilitation uh, Program that I'm in, uh, that I should be able to earn at about maybe 45000 uh, at entry level per annum. And so I will become, once again, uh, well, I am a taxpayer now, um, but I will be able to contribute more to the tax base. And then also I will be relieving the stress that's on the disability retirement fund. Um, at this point, I'm still eligible uh, for the disability uh, pension. Uh, but with the training that I have, I mean, this is something that... Um, you know, I, I'll be able to, to work once again and, and contribute. And so I'm one person, and over a period of 10 years, so if I paid $4,500 in taxes uh, per year, then over 10 years, that's $45,000. Um, $45, and then add to that the 25000 that I will not be taking from my pension anymore, and that's a total of a quarter of a million dollars. So you're looking at close to $300,000 over the next 10 years that I will be putting back into the community um, based on reliable transportation. So multiply my story by others, and then you see that it, it also adds money to our economy. It's not always going to be a, a drain on the economy. Um, I guess in general, that's um, uh, what I had wanted to say, and in particular, I guess the task force I've noticed that the advisory, uh, the chair of the advisory um, board to GRTA is included in the makeup of the task force. Now, that, that advisory um, board gives their 
input to the GRTA board, and it's through the GRTA board that their input would be included in this overall review. And so I think they should not be included in the makeup of the task force. Um, the specifics, I guess, of the task force makeup uh, will be in my written testimony. Um, and then overall, I guess just the idea again of full inclusion. Um, towards the end, where we talk about um, if changes are to be made to the approved um, system, that it would have to go through a series of public hearings. And again, we run into issues of accessibility. So there's some reference to the World Wide Web. And so if you could take note that the Guam legislature does not meet the, its website does not meet the, the, the recommendations of the World Wide Web Consortium on accessibility, on web accessibility. And so it would be nice to know that um, something like this could happen because um, in the development, of this transportation system, we're going to have to incorporate technologies that don't even exist right now. And so a lot of this uh, attention is going to a one call, one click system. But when I'm in Honolulu, I use my iPhone to find out what's going on with the bus. I use it to find out where, it, where it's at in real time. And this is done because their app is accessible to me as a person um, who um, needs non-visual access. So I'm able to independently um, access their, um, their app. And so other forms of communication that may develop over the next span of five to 20 years that we're proposed to engage in this is that, you know, we do make sure that we're open to, to changing with the technology and that maybe even our mindset right now can't even embrace that where we might be. Um, I may be able to just pick up my Apple Watch or my eyeglasses and, and look at a bus stop, and then it can communicate to me when the next bus is coming. So I don't want to leave us out of this type of technology, and I think definitely um, Will Castro should be involved in the whole process because he may be someone with that kind of vision to see um, what, um, what these technological advances might be that would greatly change the way... Um, the way we travel. Um, anyway, in the interest of time, <laughs> um, I'll submit any other comments um, in writing. And uh, again, I just, um, I'm not quite sure where I am with this particular bill. I'm, um, if, if it is something that will lead to more reliable transportation, um, I think, uh, you know that it, it should be supported, but I just can't see it happening as coolly as I'm sorry, Frank and Gokta said uh, within the time frame delineated in, in the proposed legislation. Uh, and that in the hands of um, a good executive manager, we will see measurable steps towards an improved transportation system. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Paris. Mr. Augustine. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Senator Toniano, Senator Barnes, Senator San Nicolas. My name is Enrique Augustine, the Executive Manager for the Guam Regional Transit Authority. In the audience are three of my Board of Directors, uh, Ginger Porter, Gerard Cruz, and Andrew Tedinko. I am not in support or uh, not supporting the bill because I take my advice from the board. And basically, there will be a GRTA special board meeting Friday 8 uh, of May at 4.30 in the afternoon at the GRTA office so that the board will be able to understand the content and merit of Bill 8533 and make appropriate comments and recommendations before allowing the GRTA executive manager to provide a written testimony on behalf of the GRTA board. I want to reiterate that, the gov that Governor Cabo stands in full support of Bill 8533, but, we'll like for the, uh, but we would we'll like for the Guam legislature to work closely with the administration, GRTA, and the stakeholders to pass a bill that will, in fact, improve public transportation on Guam, 
the administration has serious concerns regarding the bill as it is presented. I have a few bullet points here, and I'll go, just go down the line here. FTA consultation and review by FTA of Bill 8533 will have to take place so as not to jeopardize federal funding for GRT, which we currently rely a lot on, on federal funds. How would the bill affect the current multi-step bid for the long-term service contract bid document that is pending AG approval and then uh, advertised in the newspaper? Because we have not been, we have not competitively bid out the current uh, contract uh, with the current service provider, we have been told by the feds to put a freeze on using their money. What monies will be made available to the PPP in the interim? The revenue stream from advertisement on buses and bus shelters and revenues from parking garages, parking rides, and parking meters will not produce immediate cash infusion to fund the PPP. So where are we going to get the money in the meantime? Unless we could correctly identify and secure the correct funding source for GRTA, the the fund currently in the public transit fund will continue to be accessible or made available to other non-transit, non-transportation related agencies. The last OPA Territorial Highway Fund report dated April 2nd, 2014, indicated that a total of $8.5 million was made available to four non-transit, non-transportation related agencies. This is on the uh, proposed bill itself. Uh, on section 6305C1, formulation of solicitation package and transmission to the AG in 45 days from the date of impoundment. Uh, this is unrealistic. If the task force does not have the qualification and the experience. Section 6305C2, review of solicitation by the AG in 45 days and transmit to uh, the chief procurement officer, based on our experience, this is unrealistic unless there is a dedicated assistant AG assigned to uh, GRTA. We don't have a dedicated assigned AG to us since uh, four months ago. Section 6305C3, evaluation of submission, uh, 45 days to review and evaluate proposal and award contract. This is unrealistic if the task force does not have the qualification and experience. Section 6305C4, legislative approval required. I guess the question is, why does the Guam legislature have to approve this contract? Is this not the responsibility of the executive branch? The bill does not address the composition of the GRT Board of Directors. Uh, does the board remain in place if the role of GRT is reduced to contract administration uh, only? And lastly, the bill does not address the current staffing of GRTA. There are six classified employees who may or may, who may, or may not be impacted if the role of GRTA is reduced to contract administration only. Mr. Chair, Senators, uh, I understand that this is just the beginning of the public discussion to address the private, the public-private partnership being proposed to our community. And I look forward to more discussion, perhaps in the form of a roundtable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Augustine. Does anybody have any uh, questions of this panel? Mr. Uh, Senator Smithless. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Augustine, uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, first, I, I just wanted to state that I, I really appreciate the uh, efforts of the chair um, at, to um, try and address this um, this issue with our public transportation system. Um, in the previous term, I, I um, had a, the learning curve of, of being the chair of the public transportation system, and the first thing that, that jumped out at me was we have a $20 million problem and uh, and only a few million dollars to, to keep going. Um, so this, this I, I view it as an effort to try and, and um, find a way for us to, to address the, the needs of the agency. 
Um, with respect to what you're talking about in terms of timelines uh, being unre unrealistic, what, what would you suggest then would be realistic timelines? If the 45 days on item C1, item C2, and item C3 in each respective area is, is too short, um, how much time then do you think would be adequate? What we propose to do on Friday's uh, special board meeting is to put the heads of uh, all the board members and myself to address every line in this bill, and then we will come up with uh, our proposal. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the governor is in full support, and that we would uh, move forward as soon as possible. Uh, the, last, the first time we heard about the bill, of course, was two Mondays ago. And in order for us to meet the law, uh, the board have to meet. And by the time we get, got an advertisement on the newspaper last Friday, uh, will be the first time that the public knows that we're having a special meeting. Uh, the next newspaper ad will be tomorrow. And then, of course, Friday, we will have the board meeting. So I would have to get with the board and to come up with a more realistic time frame. But I can assure you that... Uh, uh, a simple MSB, long-term contract, uh, that is currently being reviewed, uh, that has gone back and forth uh, far too long. And for something as complicated as getting a PPP uh, with all the other things that's uh, included in making this happen, it's going to take quite a while. And if you put people that even though have the interests and maybe the time to uh, be part of this uh, uh, solicitation process. Uh, we really have to bone up to uh, to be smart on how um, how uh, procurement is really done. And so, based on the task force that's going to be assigned to this uh, to make this thing happen, I really don't have uh, an idea on how long this particular task force will be able to uh, to get their act together and, and make it happen. Okay, and the reason why I'm asking is because um, I can understand the need first to point out areas and you know, potential deficiencies in legislation, but I always like to try and figure out, okay, if that's the issue that's holding it back, then how do we find the solution to move it forward? Absolutely. So um, I really hope that the board can, um, can if they're, if they're going to go through the bill as um, uh, diligently as you're, you're, you're suggesting, that um, it's not only to identify areas of weakness within the legislation or potential areas of weakness, but also come up with recommendations on how we can mitigate those those challenges. Absolutely. Um, because for me, I, I, I sit here and I listen, and, and I, being aware also of the, of the transit situation, we do need to come up with some kind of a solution. And um, if it's going to be a public-private partnership, um, my interest is how do we make it work, you know? And uh, I also agree with what you're stating um, earlier about the... Um, the financing of the of the uh, operation. Um, how are we going to actually pay for the implementation of this bill if it does actually pass into law? Uh, so if the board can also review that as well. I know that um, the, the transit authority does have a lot of different um, um, privileges that are afforded to it under public law. Um, the franchise rights, for example, um, that was um, shared with me when I was chair. Uh, the different um, revenue generating opportunities that the, um, the authority has that have not been um, capitalized on to date. Um, if all of those can be explored as uh, financing options for this kind of a program, that'll be, that'll be very great. Um, but because we haven't done it before, the question becomes how realistic also would those projected revenues be if we were going to um, streamline it and itemize it for this particular program. So um, I, I just would like to impress upon you that uh, I, I really like the idea of the chair as proposed in, in, as, a, as a way to move us forward somehow. But um, if we can get uh, ideas on how to actually move it forward, that would be great because we need some kind of we need some kind of um, solution at this point. Right. And uh, if we can all be, be on that same page, I'm just a little concerned too because you know the in in, uh, in the past uh, an example is the filling of your position. Um, we've seen it take an inordinately long amount of time um, for the board to be able to come together and, and, and find out those kind of solutions within its own realm of control. And now here we are, we're talking about a piece of legislation that's not only going to involve the government, but a public-private partnership and the board. So um, if we're going to be able to move this forward expeditiously or, and responsibly, um, it's going to require all of us to be... Uh, to be uh, on the same page. And the reason, and for me, the reason why I wanted to share this and, and get your perspective on it was, 
Um, I can kind of see where the senator is going with respect to setting those timelines because it's kind of like, you know, saying, hey, let's let's get this thing rolling already, you know. So I guess if the board's going to meet on, fr uh, on Friday, do you anticipate how long it may take for the board to be able to, to review the bill and come up with its recommendations for the for the committee and for the author? Each individual board member is actually reviewing the document and then they'll sit down and discuss it. And hopefully by two Fridays from now, we will have something in writing. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Barnes. Okay. Um, well, before, I, before we dismiss this, this panel here, let me just, uh, just kind of comment on some of, the, um, some of the comments that have been made. Uh, one is there seems to be um, the concern about the capability of the task force that's going to be put together and the type of expertise that they may have to be able to formulate a solicitation package, uh, evaluate the proposals, and be able to then make an award. And that's why I stated at the very beginning that communications have already been initiated with uh, Federal Highway Administration, uh, and I would suggest that GRTA do the same on their part uh, up the chain to the uh, Transportation uh, Administration about seeking federal funds to be able to obtain um, consulting services to assist in the formulation of the solicitation package and evaluating the proposals. I certainly have ha had no 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 thought that that the task force that we're going to be putting together will know everything that needs to be known about operating a transit system. And so, but I think they still bring something to the table. We need the technical expertise, and I believe that's where Federal Highway may be willing to um, to provide funding. And the reason why at least I initiated communications with them was because it was them, Federal Highway Administration, in conjunction with the Department of Public Works, actually commissioned the study back in 2008 to develop the 2030 Transportation Master Plan. And in that endeavor also came up with the Guam Transit Business Plan. So I've initiated that communications. I did not get an outright no. They said, we'll look into it. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I, I remain optimistic um, that they are looking into it. Uh, the timelines are unrealistic. Well, you know, um, several weeks ago I gave, uh, I, I had the opportunity to give uh, a, a talk to a couple of, at a couple of forums. And basically the, the topic of the talk was improving GRTA by going on the unbeaten path. And the beaten path that we've been on over and over and over since I believe the year 2000 uh, has been, you know, uh, submitting bids that get kicked back, that get protested. Well, I don't believe and I don't want to accept that that's going to be the norm. And if, if, if there, there's no optimism that we can get this thing done in the timelines, and I'm certainly not... I'm trying not to look through rose-colored glasses, um, but if you know, um, if we can't get it within these timelines, and we can't get this thing to the signature table in nine months, I'll say it right now: I, if we don't get this d thing done by this term, then I will give up my seat in this legislature, and I won't run again. If we can't get something, I believe. I mean, I think this government has taken on more complicated issues than putting something like this together. If we cannot get it done, then, then, then we certainly got bigger problems than, than, than you think we have. To the question of why the legislature has to be involved in approving the contract, well, right now exist existing law says that if uh, the government agencies can enter into contracts under their own authority, contracts that are up to five years long, Anything beyond that, the legislature needs to get involved. And, and the reason for that is because public resources are being used and they do want to have a take a look at um, what, what these arrangements are 
and and will put in its its um, its concerns. Um, and in so far as what happens to the current staffing at GRTA, um, believe me, there's still going to be a lot of work that needs to be done. But the work of managing and providing the delivery of services that will basically be left to the private prov uh, private partner. So. I just want to clarify that before we dismiss this particular panel and I'll call up the next uh, set of uh, uh, panels. So, yes, ma'am. Sure. Um, I guess I just have a concern um, as far as uh, in entering into this partnership. Does it um, somehow uh, restrict the ability of the GRTA to receive other? types of federal funds so I just did in trying to research this but I just did a quick um, scan on the internet and so I had noticed that uh, there are uh, certain funds under HHS so uh, Health and Human Services under Labor Department US Department of Labor and then US Department of Education which would be through administration of Native uh, Americans and then I think it's like um, some special project on homeless children and um, that, that do allow, I'm sorry, and then also, uh, again, under the U.S. Department of Education, under the Rehabilitation Services Administration, uh, vocational rehabilitation funds that can be used towards transportation services. And so um, there is a, a national uh, directive that uh, those entities receiving federal grants that do allow for transportation services that they work uh, together so that to ensure that there's no overlap or gaps in services so I guess that was my main concern in, in addressing uh, the composition of the task force is to make sure that the non-inclusion of the, the entities I just mentioned would uh, kind of uh, uh, not meet requirements of Guam receiving certain grants for transportation services well we'll certainly I mean after this public hearing of course we will take the uh, the testimony has been provided and we will go back and take a look at, at the concerns that have been raised, one of them being the composition of the task force. Uh, the other part about uh, the ability to continue to re be able to receive federal grants, mm -hmm. uh, that is why it's very important that GRTA as a government entity uh, still needs to stay in that picture uh, to, to go after these grants, to administer the grants, to administer the contract, and, and basically to provide oversight on the performance of the contract. Other than that, though, the private partner uh, basically uh, has their own role to play, and that is to manage the delivery of services um, and, 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 um, and, of course, giving them the, the opportunities to be able to recoup that investment over this 20-year period. And that, how they recoup that is then to be basically negotiated um, um, at the time uh, when a selection is made uh, mm -hmm. to then sit down and, and see what is it that's gonna, that it's going to take for that investor to, to want to come on as a partner. Okay? Yeah, and just one more. Sure. I'm sorry. It's just in the interest of sustainability and, um, you know, like kind of developing our, our own local talents. Is there a way to... Uh, earmark a portion of what this private company might make um, towards the um, implementation of scholarships that would support uh, local people getting um, uh, training and education in the area of uh, that would be related to building uh, and 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 sustaining a healthy transit system. I, I don't I don't I really don't know uh, okay. but that is something that uh, we should take a note of and, and see how far that goes All right. okay thank all right you. thank you uh, I'm gonna go ahead and call up the next group I have uh, Lynn Tidinko uh, mr. Bill Cundiff and Ms. Evelyn Duenas
Mr. Dinkle, you can go ahead and begin. You can go ahead. Half a day panel of honorable senators. Um, my name is Lynn Tidinko, and I wear many leadership hats in the disability arena. Um, and so we're very actively involved in things that, you know, in areas of emphasis that concern us, transportation, education, uh, housing, everything. And today I am here as the president of Self, Act Self Advocates in Action Guam, which is a nonprofit organization consisting of individuals with disabilities and their families and associate members who support our mission of becoming independent fully included in, and integrated into society. So I'm up here with a collective, uh, some collective points that uh, I've been asked to speak, you know, speak to uh, from our, member, our, our general membership. And um, so if you'll allow me, we just got a copy of the bill or access to the bill um, a couple of days ago, so we haven't fully been able to digest. But um, there were some points that some of our members asked me to speak to, so I'm going to, you know, bring that up right now on, you know, the ones that, uh, the issues that we have um, concerns about. Um, like I said, we haven't digested it fully, but maybe if someone could please answer one, qu uh, the first question is, okay, uh, pri public-private uh, partnership. For the most part, the present, uh, the pres the parts of the uh, bill that I've read so far have been pretty favorable. But we have some questions. Just for the sake of asking, um, we'd like to know, okay, if the public, um, okay, our point, uh, I'm sorry, the private sector. Let's say for some reason they're not able to fulfill, whether it be financially or uh, with the inventory of equipment or something happens where, let's say, I mean, God forbid they go bankrupt or something. Uh, I wasn't able to find anything yet, but maybe somebody can clarify what is our backup plan there? Do we have a backup plan? Not saying that we're wishing anything like that. But that was one of the, the questions that, you know, was brought up. And I know a few years ago, um, with we had some sort of partnership um, where I believe uh, the management of uh, GRTA, I believe, was under Public Works. It was like a division. Is it? I don't know. Would that be something would be that would be considered too? That was one question. And the other one, sir. Um, panel, distinguished panel, being a person with a disability, we rely, my peers and I rely on an efficient transportation system for medical, employment, education, and yet uh, religious, and yes, recreational. You know, we deserve to, uh, you know, to be able to get to the beach or wherever, you know, wherever we can uh, be afforded to within the time frame that the bus uh, runs. So that was our next concern, was the task force, the composition of the task force. Our motto in our organization, and it is nationwide um, with persons with disability, is nothing about us without us. And uh, with the composition of the task force, we noticed that there, the representation was with, um, with DISID and or his designee and we work very closely with Mr. Servino and his uh, d you know his staff however I do I, um, I do believe and um, my peers and I do believe that you should that there should this should be under uh, consideration where you have an actual person with a disability who rides the bus, who understands to be on the task, uh, you know, to be on the task force, because who knows better what a person with a disability needs? And sometimes uh, people think to know, that, you know, other people think that they can guess and, okay, these guys need this, these guys need that, but who better? to represent there than an actual person with a disability. And our organization um, consists of cross individuals with cross disability. Now, I, we asked that, you know, that be taken under consideration. I know that a few years ago, before uh, the Calvo Tenorio administration, even pre-election, we had a forum 
with self hosted by the self advocates by my peers and I and we had asked the then senator all the senators uh, before he was a governor and lieutenant governor and the distinguished senators that did attend we asked to humbly have a seat at the table in, in areas where we're concerned which is almost everywhere education housing welfare and it's just so we can give our input um, and let me give you a perf perfect example of that. Uh, we had, I attended, I know I attended both the, um, actually we hosted the, ter the transit forum over at the Hyatt because I am the chair for the DD Council. And I did attend the oversight hearing a few weeks ago. And um, there were, during our, our seniors putting together, we have a transportation team where we were ready, we have concerns that we want to bring up. And uh, one of the comments was, oh my goodness, we respect the fact that your distinguished panel, sir, is trying to address and improve our transportation needs, but this is why we need to have a seat at the table, because even this very public hearing, sir, the time, it's, it's not conducive for persons with disability. Uh, first of all, if let me just give a recap. The transit runs from 5.30, supposed to be, to till 12.30 p.m., and then from 2.30 to 8.30 p.m. And this public hearing was scheduled at 2 o'clock, so we're not complaining. We're asking to uh, please take it under, under consideration that in the future, um, you know, the honorable senators will take into consideration the schedule. For my peers to, for my peers and I to be here today, some of uh, there was one individual that had a bus ride, and he was supposed to be here at 6:50. He's in the hospital right now, so he can't be here. The rest of us, I personally, was here at uh, a little bit after 10, and we had there was a public hearing in here, so we weren't we had nowhere to sit. So we were forced to go and try to find, you know, somewhere to sit. Luckily, we went to go eat. But in the future, if you could please take into consideration the scheduling of the times for um, hearings or any kind of meetings that concern us to be uh, able, for us to be able to attend without having to be here and getting on the bus at 5.30, 6.30 in the morning and then having to uh, all get on, you know, to wait here at that time and not have any place to sit. So we ask for that consideration. And uh, those are the points that I wanted to talk to, uh, you know, talk about and um, about the backup. The backup, what, is there a backup plan? And the timing and the inclusions of persons with disability on the task force, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dink Mr. Dinko. And, and uh, those concerns have been noted. Uh, most in particular uh, when we schedule meetings which involves uh, persons with disabilities uh, needs to be uh, we need to be more sensitive to that and we will in the future thank you thank you uh, mr. Cundiff hi my name is uh, Bill Cundiff and I'm chairman of the uh, Guam Veterans Commission uh, thank you for the invite senators good afternoon I know that change is very, very difficult to, to happen, but I've been looking at this man's transit issue for the longest time. And I think, I think it's, it's time that we, we try something new, uh, and that new would be to try and privatize the system. I really appreciate that. I don't have any uh, written uh, testimony, so what I'm gonna say is, is based on what is read here, and I, I might have to wing it a little bit. And we will, uh, we are recording the session, so okay. uh, we will make a written transcript of uh, pretty much what, what was said at this hearing. All right. Thank you. So, so therefore, I am in support of 85-33. Uh, um, going through the bill that I just look at, there's a couple of concerns, not concerns, but some suggestions that, that I have. Uh, number one, um, when, when the when they finally go privatize, privatizing this, this um, program, do the employees have any protection? Those current employees have protection from the government once the private company take over? Uh, because it appears that they are going, the private company, 
they're going to be taking over even even the employee portion of of, of this program and much like the uh, the federal government when when they're going into privatization of certain areas um, they do have protection for the employees so that that will be one of my suggestions once the task force is 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 the program or the task force duties are completed are they are they eliminated okay that's that's the question i have the um the other suggestion is in 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 as far as the uh the composition of the of the uh the task force i like to suggest that um we put a community planner as as a member of that task force normally a community planner understands a lot of these things that are going in the community and perhaps they can lend their their expertise to to the to the board or to the to the members of that organization <clears throat> It is very important that we, I think that we ensure that this mass transit program works for everybody. I'm very, very um, up on our veterans. We received, or not we, but the mass transit authority received, I believe $1.3 million to provide services to existing services for our veterans and for those in the active duty community. We don't have any services for the active duty as far as providing them transportation to come out into the community. We do not have any, any services for our veterans to go to their appointments or, or any, any, anything in that, in that fashion. So I'm not sure if, if we still have that grant of $1.3 million. I'm not sure. But if we do have it, I think we may, we may be able to do something about Ensuring that our veterans and their active duty folks are are assimilated into this into this program, we have a program at both Navy and 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 Anson Air Force Base. So when our new arrivals come, we we take a bus and we send them around the island so they can see the island, the island tour. It's called the island tour. When they first got here, they don't have any transportation. They're, they're, it takes about 30 to 40 days or six days for the transportation or their cars to get here. While the men and the women are riding or ensuring the mission is completed, we need to get those families off base so they can see the island, they can, they can enjoy the island, they can, get, they can apply for jobs, they can go shopping in the community, and so on. We don't have that service now. And I think it's very important that we make it happen. I, I support this um, again, once once again, and I want to ensure that our community get the services that they desire. Um, I kids came back recently from uh, Honolulu, uh, and I tell you, the mass transit program there is awesome. For those with disability, my gosh, people move to the back of the bus and there's a portion there on the bus where they can um, modify for those with disability to come to the, into the bus and, and serve them. The, the respect is, is awesome. I, I, I rode that bus all around the island just to make sure, just to see how, how it works. And I tell you, it really, really works. So I hope that one day we will get to that uh, uh, arena as far as getting our folks the best transportation in the world. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kandiv. Evelyn? Good afternoon. Um, Chair Adam, Senator Tina Barnes, Senator Esmodan, Senator Nicholas. Thank you once again for this opportunity to um, uh, address my concern regarding our public transportation services. First of all, I would like to um, say that I'm glad we now have a general manager for 
GRTA that has been a long stretch for GRTA to um, search for a GM. And he's been um, a very important person with GRTA since he got in to be able to streamline some of the problems that GRTA had for ages. As you can tell, I'm giving away that I've been a writer ever since the transit got to where it's at. And we have gotten better, but occasionally we will, we will go for it, then ending up going backwards. So we seem to be like the seesaw that goes backwards. So, as much as trying to really work with the current system that we have, current services that we have, I do understand that it's a struggle every day for the government as well as for, for the people that rely on the system, most especially. But at the same time also, I do know that it takes teamwork to get these things going, no matter how hard and difficult it is. And most especially what we need is for the leaders and our governor to work together. That's where that starts, and then down to the community. It's been a long struggle for mass transit for GRTA alone right now. We went from GMTA, which is Guam Mass Transit Authority. They abolished that system and we recreated GRTA. The bill that created GRTA is Public Law 30-05. That bill basically has a lot for the agency to provide, but it only reached a certain percentage. Maybe if we would have provided, or the legislature, or the governor's office would have just followed that, we wouldn't be where we're at right now. I, I disagree right now with this private partnership only because right now we still have a long stretch on the contract that GRTA is trying to work. There's so much tied up everywhere. One of them is the Attorney General's office. One of them is General Services Agency. I have asked for many years through the legislature in reference to the public transit system, for someone or even the entire legislature, as well as our governor's office, to review the, the uh, procurement process, because that's where our biggest delay is. But no one has ever come forward to clarify that or to even clear that. It's been decades and decades. That's why we have transit going back and forth. The people that needs to put this together is the people with full authority, which is the one legislature, the governor's office, to work together with GRT and get it going. And then, whatever decision is decided, throws out to the community, share that input with the community, get the inputs community. But we haven't gone there just yet. We've been spinning around with hearings after hearings, back and forth. And Senator, frustration for transit is everywhere. It's here, it's out there. It's in the government of Guam, nothing new. 
But what we need to do, and I've, I've been going through this almost every day, challenges every day, because I rely on the system as well as others. I only wish I can grab my keys every morning to get up and go wherever I need to go, to be on time to wherever I need to be. We're just recreating the will over and over again. Maybe 10 years down the line, I would agree with the Private Partnership Act or um, service. But for right now, we're not even halfway done with the bid for the MSB because it's still tangled up at the, the attorney generals. It's, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. But the people with the authority should be able to untangle that. And this has been ongoing with mass transit, GRT. It always has been left hanging. So in order for this to really get buckled down, everybody needs to work together. The feds have been assisting well. The, the, the plans that was given by Parsons and Brinkerhoff was a yay in the beginning. And you, like you said, you hit the head right on the, the head, the however nail. we say that. The nail right on the head. The head right on, the nail right on the head. But it, we haven't gotten anywhere because of this back and forth thing. Am I frustrated? Yes challenges every day. I'll tell you, I see multiple breakdowns every day. Every day, multiple. But we swallow and just deal with what we have. Is there empathy out there for those of us that deal with that? I would assume there is. But to move it to a perspective, respectful place still drags. And transit will always be a problematic thing, and it shouldn't be, but it is. It's stressful everywhere. But if we put our teamwork together, our heads together, and ideas, and let it flow with what we have, Rather than going into something like this where it may work later for me, I see later down the line, not now, but do with what we have now and correct the pieces that in the public law 30-05. Fit those in and try that out first and see where does it take us. Because when they abolish GMT, they abolished it only because they said, one, no money to do it, which made it worse when they abolished it. So I was one of those individuals that was on that commission to recreate, not GMTA, but GRTA. And there's the same very few concepts in that bill, similarity with this, in there. But it's also not reflecting to the public law 30-05. Again, the problem is money. GRTA has money all over the places, but we can't pull back anymore. So my question is, can this body give GRTA the amount it's asking to run the system effectively? Give it another shot as GRTA to prove itself. But in order for that to happen, GRTA has to be fully staffed, fully furnished 
with what it's requesting. But it hasn't been done. So I ask each and every one of you in this panel to rethink before we do something like this. The only thing I like about this bill, yeah, the 10 year stretch of a contract. And not dealing with a contract every three to four or five years. But anything other than that, as someone said earlier, is there protection for the people that, which are the drivers that drive the system for us, which is the next backbone to the system? Because that too has a weak um, support. And I'll tell you, I'll throw this in as a humor, but the bus, and this is only my saying, the bus is more disabled than I am, who uses the system. And GRTA has funds to procure buses. The procure is hung up. We need your support as well as the governor's support to release that hung up thing with the procuring. Because that's where the biggest issue is, is the procuring. And to, to really release some of the smallest thing that transit has, that's another key point, is that. Because Transit is a key to everybody, not just for individuals with disabilities, my mom calls it. Everybody overall. As a matter of fact, it's a shared right system for all. So let's try to make it better for everyone. And stop, I ask. We keep, these ideas are good, but we're, where the funding is. There's, there's uh, the franchise issue out there that's been running for decades now. But it hasn't gone into place because a lot of legalities. So, so it's very hard to move. But unless GRTA and the community has everyone's full support to move in, then I'm pretty sure we will move the direction everybody wants it to be. And just let it breathe clean air. But every time we move forward, we go 20 steps back. I remember when transit was running 15 buses. 15. We went from Back in the mid 80s, we went from 30 to 15. Now we're down to 11. We ran from 5.30 in the morning to 10.30 or 11.30 at night. Now we're only running from 5.30 to 7.30. So that's why I say we're not moving forward. We're going backwards. Because we had 27 at one time, 15 for so many years, and then now 11 for so many years, for decades almost. So really, if you ask me, we're getting smaller. And the smaller we get, the harder we get. Which to me, it should be the smaller we get, the easier we get. But it's reversed. So I ask each and every one of you again, can we read complete public law 30-05 first, then maybe work on this later? Because we still have a contract that's still flowing in the air for so many years, again. 
and it's really not going anywhere. And I, I don't have authority. GRTA has some authority, but from the front office down here, Attorney General, GSA, those are the people with authority to move the actual the actual document that GRTA needs to function as appropriate as they should. So this for me may be later. My dream down the line. I want to see public law 30-05 fully furnished because that's where it's at right now. So, Ms. Duenas, then you signed up that you were in favor of Bill um, no, 85. So I'll change that and yeah. you're not in favor. Not in favor. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions from this panel? Okay. Sure. bring it up because uh, you know a lot of them have, have been employed there for the longest time so then you have a contract all of a sudden that says we're taking over everything so you know you are no longer employed or we're gonna decrease your salary substantially we're gonna we're gonna take away some of the benefits you have so I think it's very important that they, we protect what they have and and I, I think that's anywhere you go uh, in the private sector, not so. You can get fired tomorrow and then you're done. But since we owe these folks um, the respect for serving our, our community for the longest time. Well, if I, if, I'm, if, I, if I can remember correctly, the grant said to provide services to existing services, okay, right. to, to improve service to existing services. And I've questioned that before because uh, we don't have any services for the veterans to go to their, to, to their appointments and there are no services for the active duty folks to get off the base and and do whatever they, they, they need to do. I'm not sure where that is at. I'm not sure if they've done anything, but I know I did my research on that. Uh, I it's don't know. A, it's a grant that's available, but you're not sure whether we've ever We, we have the grant here. Oh, we do have the yes, grant already. Do. Okay. Yeah, we do. And that grant was, was a result of um, Mrs. Obama and Mrs. Biden as they work with congressional uh, leaders to provide rural transportation to our service members and our veterans. Okay. And so I believe we applied for that. Okay. We got, we got and, the money. And it should um, be within. So, um, okay. Yeah, I was just interested uh, right. on that. It seemed like you were implying that we had it before and you're not sure if we have it anymore. We never had those services. To, to but the money itself? Th the money is here. Okay. I, I know the money is here somewhere. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cundiff. Thank you. Uh, Senator Barnes, did you have a comment? Um, Cito Smasi, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all the folks who came in today to testify uh, on this bill. And I just want to share, Mr. Chair, that uh, for many years now, uh, and um, we've been trying to see how we can get a very good mass transit going for our ridership 
Um, I do remember the days of Public Law 30-05. I know that uh, it was worked on uh, in as far as even trying to get the Mayor's Council involved, uh, Mr. Chair, by uh, calling it the e publico and having a, a pilot project with, with uh, main hub stations being one in the north, one in the central, and one in the south. Um, I, I just want to say that to all those that are here, uh, sometimes when you engage with public-private partnerships, uh, it's the best way to go. It's because it accesses funding uh, that can't be tapped in by the uh, by the government of Guam. But more importantly, it gives a a full, meaningful, uh, um, I guess, coming together from both the business community and the government of Guam to provide for those basic services. So. Uh, I want to say that I will continue to support any attempt that will help uh, bring this um, uh, full public transit to uh, operating services, maybe try to emulate what Hawaii has today. As we look at the present bill today and what has been shared with uh, from some of the previous speakers, I think uh, maybe just on the task force looking at the representation, though the task force is good at, as it's created, maybe uh, getting a representation from the ridership, maybe one from the north, one from the central, but also the uh, definitions on some of the uh, the um, findings that are here, uh, one mind that one that is important is the quality, and and uh, how do you measure um, quality over the quantity? Uh, um, I want to say also with the proposal, um, what about the evaluating factors that are there? But I I will stress again, Mr. Chair, that uh, as I look at this bill uh, going forward, uh, I think it addresses a lot of what has already been existing today, and at least it brings forward the representation of wanting to make Guam Transit uh, for our ridership, uh, whether it be for the veterans, whether it be for those with disabilities, whether it be just for the uh, general membership uh, from the North, Central, and South, that, that that whole collaboration can come together. I still believe that an engagement, working closely with the Municipal Council may be important, but something that could be revisited uh, at a longer run. But I will continue to stay close. Evelyn, I know you've been writing for many, many, many years, uh, uh, I think over two decades already, but uh, Gov Guam is here to, the policymakers is here to create the policy and this is the executive branch that will execute that and I think a coming together and including the private partners out there, I think those stakeholders all need to come together and we can hope that that, that will work uh, more, uh, that would be more uh, fruitful so that there's a win-win for everybody. So Mr. Chair, thank you for at least bringing this to the forefront again. Thank you, Senator. Senator Sinclair. Uh, Senator Spaldon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to go back and I wanted to ask uh, uh, Lynn Tadinko and Jim Spaldon here. Um, <laughs> you mentioned, uh, you know, when you were looking at the makeup of the uh, task force, and of course you mentioned that you're, you're recommending that on the task force should be a person with a disability who actually rides the bus. And of course, one of the members that's designated in the bill is the director of DISID. Is there a disconnect between the persons with disability or a, a certain group of disabilities with the director that you don't feel that the director could represent uh, everybody? No, sir. As a matter of fact, Mr. Servino has always been very supportive and he always gives us his ear. We have a collaborative effort. I just feel it uh, goes back to our motto, nothing about us without us. And that's not only here on Guam, it's nationwide. Ben Servino does support persons with disability and he is a person with a disability, so he understands both sides. But um, as I stated earlier, we've always asked, and uh, even with the pilot project, we asked the governor to, if we could have a, a seat at the table for the planning and just, who, it's, you know, not saying that we're going to boss anybody around, but our input as persons with disability matters because 
who knows what we need best and uh, I I gave today and don't think I'm knocking you senators or anything I'm my motto was educate don't hate so that's why we're here to work together and I shared that's why I shared and educated how if someone was even on this planning you know we got input we were able to give input even for just the public hearing today it would have been scheduled at an earlier time where it was it would be great for you, you would probably have to get more chairs right. because it act the, this the transportation affects our lives not and I'm I know it affects even the general public but I'm speaking on behalf of my peers right. and if you had somebody with a disability um, even on the planning side of it they would have had said oh honorable senators you know I'm I'm actually the, uh, uh, personally okay uh, in favor of a lot of what I've read so far mm -hmm. But um, I'm here representing my group, and but, but the thing is, if we already, if we were a part of the planning, we would have said, honorable senators, okay, this public hearing, it's a good idea. But you, we, you would have had somebody say, I think you could schedule it at a time where the people that it affects would be able to give public input and I do know from it wasn't me that called in but I do know there was another individual we were talking right. before this public hearing and they had called Senator at his office and had spoken with Charlene and this was last week right when we heard about it on the radio and da 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 and spoke with Charlene saying could there be consideration to change at least the time right and uh she, the answer that was given on the phone was no because it already went out for public notice but um and the comment that we were you know the conversation uh with other people was like wait a minute this is our government and if they want the people to input and it's thing it's uh you know areas where it affects our lives then they could send out the next day a uh, public uh, public notice saying right. Due to circumstances that were brought to our attention, the public hearing is now going to be rescheduled at 9:30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't. So that's why we're here to let you know. It's right. we're not opposing. We're not trying to be a hindrance. Right. We're just educating. And, right. And, um, and and so that's where it comes from, sir. And, and I just understand, educating. Lynn, and I and I appreciate what you're saying. And, and the chairman, chairman Ad has acknowledged that from now on we do have to be more sensitive yes. to. The, my, my question goes basically and, and this is where I, you spoke about somebody being on the task force with disabilities right. and the question basically comes back to does the director of DISID not represent uh, you will in other words my my issue here Lynn and you've been in so many committees and you've done so <laughs> much so many activities and so many projects mm -hmm. that you know when you bring too many people to the table right it, it sometimes nothing moves whereas if you limit it to a certain number of people who represent certain groups and in this case it would be mr servino i mean your 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 recommendation was on top of mr servino being on the task force yes. that somebody else be on the task force okay. and my question is does mr servino not uh fully understand what you would have input on as far as being a person with a disability he yes, does yes, and as far in, uh, and as a matter of fact our group supported Ben Servino uh, we had an input with the government and gave well, our well, recommendation well, to get him but he is not a bus rider he is not a bus rider and I totally respect Ben Servino and like I said our group <laughs> asked the governor okay. recommended him to be the director so right. he is and he is a disability person with a disability but he does not he is not a bus rider and we're trying to in everything that we do have a seat at the table that ever so important voice and nationwide that you know we talk about self-advocacy and we have a team of, of, of persons with disability who teach our peers you know I'm one of the facilitators and Na even nationwide I'm on the self-advocacy committee out in DC and they always say if you want things to be done always have that representation now whether it be me or someone else I'm not saying to be me but we need somebody with a disability to give that uh, right. you know that but input. you're not saying Ben can do it no oh I'm not doubting his ability 
at all. Ben can sit on the task force. However, I just think a person with a disability who actually rides the bus, because mm -hmm. I have the utmost respect for Mr. Okay. Servino, but okay. he, you know, it's a, an, a, as a self-advocate, our voices are the strongest, and I think one of us, one of our, our peers, should be on that task force. And I, I wasn't advocating for myself, right? You know, no, we but understand that. Yes, yeah, so I that. have the okay. utmost respect for Mr. Servino. We Thank all do. You. I appreciate that. It's okay, just, it should be a bus rider too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I, I'd like to just make some uh, closing remarks. And and first of all, I you know I. Everybody talks, and not just you, Mr. Kundiv, but everybody talks about how the Hawaii Transit uh, works. And I've written it too, and I think it does work. But I also think that GRTA can work if we properly resource it. Uh, I think Senator Sir Nicholas said uh, earlier uh, that when he was the chairman last term, he realized that we have a $20 million challenge and we're trying to fight it with about a $4 million uh, budget and that's just not going to work. The study that was done in 2008, uh, which resulted in the uh, transit business plan, uh, basically they came up with a conclusion that to be able to provide the level of service that is really needed, which, for example, having uh, buses available uh, every 30 minutes, uh, extending the, the hours and whatnot, we would need about 50 buses to be able to achieve that level of service. You certainly can't do that when we're having, how many you said, 11? Okay. And, um, and, and again, uh, you know, so, so if, if we don't properly resource it, um, then, then we won't be able to, um, to provide the level of service needed. Um, you, you, Evel, you know, Ms. Duenas mentioned about what, it, what we're going to need to make these things happen is we're going to need teamwork. And I'm certainly uh, very encouraged to say that, uh, that I, I think that that teamwork, if with everybody pulling together, uh, is going to happen. The governor's office has made the public statement that they support uh, the direction that we're going with Public Law 85. Um, in fact, a representative from the governor's office is here. Um, and, um, and so I think they're behind this effort. Uh, already, uh, we, we're going to be need, we're going to be working closely, uh, as well as the stakeholders who have who have happened here. Um, you know, with respect to the fact that uh, you know, without getting into the reasons why uh, the, the, you were given the answer no, uh, we were going to stick with the two o'clock. I uh, can assure you that we will schedule another roundtable discussion. Uh, and and we'll make sure that we schedule it properly, whether in the morning or in the afternoon, uh, to give everybody a better time, and also to kind of go over some of the things that were said. Uh, I, I think, uh, Ms. Duenas, you you pretty much hit the nail on the head uh, when you said that the public transit uh, is not going anywhere, except that maybe it's going backwards. Uh, the bill does state the statistic that over the past four years, the ridership has decreased by as much as 30% over the past four years. Um, and again, you know, I certainly cannot fault the provider. Uh, when he's provided a month-to-month -month contract, he's not going to go out there and invest millions of dollars uh, to procure new buses when he doesn't know from month to month if he's going to have that contract to be able to recoup his investment. And we've been doing that for the past 10 years. It's time to get off that beaten path and try something different, okay? Um, I, I think that the issue about the protection of the employees, uh, that's certainly a very valid point. There's no mention of it in here. Uh, certainly that concern will be reflected in this bill and we will make specific mention that the employees of GRTA will not be displaced. Um, I, I also want to, um, uh, while it's, it's very, I'll be the first to admit that Bill 85 is, is certainly, doesn't have all the answers that are needed. Uh, but the intention, I think uh, the committee did as best as it could to put together a bill uh, to get things to get this issue out of the starting gate, 
um, but um, but the real intent was introduce it because then that is when the conversation begins at a formal level we have public hearings otherwise if it's just you know you and me talking uh, that 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 doesn't hit the level that we need to get it at we need to have it introduced as a bill a proposed piece of legislation get a reaction from the front office saying it's a good idea let's push it uh, we need to get together and see how to further uh, make it better um, the concerns about having adequate representation uh, for persons with disabilities on the task force um, again we will go back and look at that but I believe that there are of the of the uh, seven eight categories uh, of membership on the task force there are three categories where persons with disabilities could possibly be represented one of them is uh, it says the director of DISIT or his designee shall represent individuals with disabilities another category is that the chairperson of the GRTA transportation advisory committee I think I think that also represents the um, the persons with disabilities if I'm correct uh, maybe I got the, the name wrong but they will submit to the governor three nominations and the chairperson may include himself for the governor to select from and then a third category is that a representative of public transit riders the executive director of GRTA shall submit to the governor three nominations for the governor to select from it doesn't say it has to be you know it cannot be somebody who is not disabled it just says three nominations uh, to represent public transit riders so uh, but we will still go back and we'll take a look to see how we might be able to further narrow that okay uh, yes one last question since I haven't um, heard it anywhere although I heard a small clipping the procurement process is that ever going to be revisited the procurement process is um, being uh, actually the committee this committee is actually uh, working on the procurement process itself uh, we believe the committee believes that the procurement law on Guam is still a very sound um, framework uh, but it needs to be updated and and we've had bills that have been introduced last term got vetoed this term and and it just sometimes takes time to to work those things through but those are being addressed but I tell you the fact that the multi-step bid has not yet been put out on the on the streets so that vendors can start bidding on it is because it has taken that long for GRTA to put it together to formulate it I I was I was I was working with the GRTA back in 2010 on trying to put together the package so it's not the procurement process okay um, but regardless the, the fact is is that I know that for example the multi-step bid package is still up at the Attorney General's office being reviewed they're looking at it from the standpoint of legal the, the legal form um, the, the the bid the bid for the for the buses and the vans were supposed to be open yesterday before it even got open it got protested but that's not because the that's not because the uh, procurement process is flawed it's I mean the protests that are allowed is a is, is a way of being able to make sure that the process is being followed one key question like I said I'm giving away the years I've been with transit how did transit go from an RFP to a multi-step because the Supreme Court said that the that for what was being uh, solicited the, re the request for proposal was not the appropriate selection method but instead should have been for as an invitation for bid the multi-step bid 
is simply another form of the invitation for bit. And we can get into that later, but uh, right now, you know, uh, basically I want to focus in on the public-private partnership and not the procurement. We can focus on that, as <coughs> that excuse me. Uh, one other thing, um, you said employees of GRDA, correct? Yes. There's another important piece on transit, and that's not just um, passengers, but also drivers that drive the bus. Yeah. We also need to consider that. Yes. Because we have well-trained drivers that are slightly moving for a better, because transit is not at its best okay. flow of service. So that, too, we need to look into okay. consideration. All right. Mr. Chair, may I make just a very brief comment, please? Yes, ma'am. I want, I want to thank you and your committee for b putting this forward, and I do applaud the efforts that you, that you folks are trying to, uh, to make to enhance our transit system. And if you see me sitting here today, it's not a complaining session. I'm asking, you know, to, you know, to collaborate, and I just want to applaud the efforts because it's a starting point, and um, I rely on the transit as well as my peers, and we really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so there's no other questions. Uh, the Committee on Transportation, Infrastructure, Lands, Border Protection, Veterans Affairs, and Procurement hereby adjourns this public hearing. The time is now uh, five minutes, still four.